Welcome to WesleyGospel.com. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about restoring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the prophetic ministry. Um, there's only two other people with ministries, two or three, that I know of that have caught this vision and um, and understand what it means. Um, I have dreams and visions. Um, I do not have elaborate open visions. Um, the most dramatic ones have been like little white angel uh, lights every once in a while. But maybe if I, you know, prayed more for visions, I'd get them. But I do have closed visions sometimes, and I have, on various occasions, operated in prophetic ministry for certain people with regard to dreams and with regard to praying for them and then seeing the closed vision and have information actually in it that they could confirm. So um, I'm not what you would call a nabby. I don't have the nabby gift. Um, I'm always open to it. I'm open to the nabby gift, um, but I think that that's more something that comes and uh, it develops uh, in actual church ministry. So I, because I haven't been a pastor, um, I have been around a lot of people. I haven't been a traveling evangelist. There's no real need for the nabby gift to kick in. So, um, however, there there has been times where I've been podcasting and just a torrent of feeling and thought. As, as kind of just rushed through me. So I wonder at times while I've podcasted and I've got very passionate about things, if the nabby gift started to flow through me at certain times. Um, but I've never had anybody confirm that or email me back and say, dude, when you said such and such on the podcast, it was a total word of knowledge. Like nobody's ever said that, but I'm, you know, it could happen, you know. It's just, you know, getting validation from other people that, you know. Yeah, I mean, is it, is it possible for the nabby gift to kick in while I'm podcasting? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I don't I don't believe the nabby uh, gift of prophecy, N-A-B-I, Hebrew word, I don't believe that that kicks in unless you're around people and you're in prayer ministry you have to be like literally in physical proximity like several feet away from them in order for that to happen um so you know all the lord has really kind of you know give me given me was you know basically dreams and closed visions for people on on various occasions um and angel lights with my eyes open um little sp sparkles and that's it, you know, and I'm, I'm thankful for those gifts. And, and if, you know, if I ever get into a church type ministry in a charismatic church someday, I might be able to develop those other gifts and that'd be really great. But um, more important than all of these gifts is the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, because that's how you save people from hell, man. And. Uh, pastors are supposed to do the work of an evangelist, not just give a bunch of happy, encouraging words of knowledge to everybody. And so I want to talk about this. Um, there's about three or four charismatic ministers that caught a vision for this in the past 20 years, that the gospel of Jesus Christ needs to become the central message, the central theological standard for all word of knowledge ministry. Um, this doesn't mean that every time you give a word of knowledge to somebody, it has to have be laced with soteriology, but it couldn't hurt. Because you need to keep the prophetic stream pure and keep the spirit of Balaam out and the spirit of Jezebel out. And the best way to keep the prophetic stream pure is to load up your theological orientation with soteriology, doctrine. Bible doctrine on salvation, Book of Romans type thinking, 
prophetically gifted people that have dreams, visions, and nabby gift prophecies have got to get themselves grounded in the book of Romans. I cannot emphasize this enough. And if you don't believe in that doctrinally, you're an unbeliever. And if you have nabby gifts and you have seer gifts, okay, and you do not believe in nor proclaim the doctrines of justification and sanctification, I have one word to call you, unbeliever. You are an unbeliever, okay? And you may be in some sort of a pseudo-New Age, pseudo-Christian setup, okay? But that is false prophecy to not have Romans, 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 like everything what you're thinking about. I mean, say, well, why can't I? Because you just can't. You're a minister of Jesus Christ and of his gospel, and you have got to convey the teaching and the preaching of the book of Romans to people in, in all of its dynamics, like a prism that shoots light in many different directions. You've got to understand that this is not only the starting place for spiritual growth and salvation from hell, this is the entire Christian life is to be anchored in this. And uh, so our Lauren Sanford was the son of John Sanford, who was the first person to write a prophetic ministry book. I've said before that David Wilkerson technically started uh, the, the prophetic movement in 1973 with his book, The Vision. I was wrong about that. It seems, actually, no, I, I was wrong about that. Uh, it seems that the first prophetic ministry book was by Don Basham. Don Basham. Uh, and it was called A Handbook on Tongues Interpretation and Prophecy, and it came out in 1971. Uh, and my understanding is, is that it's basically an explanation of 1 Corinthians 14. And my understanding is that it mainly relies on the nabby gift understanding that kind of flows out of speaking in tongues. So that, in my understanding, that's the first book on prophetic ministry. 1971 Handbook on Tongues Interpretation and Prophecy by Don Basham. And then uh, and then you had the Elijah Task by by John Sanford. And this got a lot of visibility. And his son R. Lauren Sanford um, was mentored by his dad spiritually ended up with the charismatic church a prophetic ministry church and he put out a book called purifying the prophetic because he saw a lot of ideology coming into word of knowledge ministries he that was not grounded in the gospel just all sorts of weird thoughts like little god's heresy manifest sons of god heresy sonship movement uh Material prosperity, self-fulfillment, narcissism type thinking, political prophecies, and all kinds of stuff. That's just not the book of Romans. It's like these people just really lost their way. Sure, the gifts of the words of knowledge continued, and sure, they were from the Holy Spirit, and they were edification, encouragement, and comfort, 1 Corinthians 14.3. But the theological groundwork, the theological ideologies were so off base and it's still this way today um, that the theological foundations um, of Pentecostal theology are just gone they're just gone um, theology biblical doctrine book of Romans salvation gospel preaching type it's just gone and the Holy Spirit is helping these people and uh, and, there's, and he's still manifesting and, 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 and giving words of knowledge, but in, in terms of Bible teaching, these people are so far gone, and it, it's really sad. Like, it's such a deterioration. So, our Lauren Sanford put out a book, Purifying the Prophetic. John Paul Jackson did his part in other ways through video modules and s s 
teachings and put out a, a statement with James Gall called Protocols of Prophetic Ministry. And uh, John, John Paul Jackson was a huge fan of R. Lawrence Sanford and a friend of him, and he endorsed both of his books. And um, John Paul Jackson was one of the original Kansas City prophets. He's the only one that I know of that did not have a scandal associated with him. The only mistake that John Paul Jackson ever made was he made some bad stock market predictions uh, in the early 80s when he was just learning the gift of prophecy and a lot of people lost a lot of money. And so that was like a really big embarrassing thing for him. You know, he had dreams about stock market problems and he prophesied them and apparently everybody sold a bunch of stocks when they shouldn't have and then they blamed him for his failed prophecy. And so he he kind of left IHOP in shame and started his own ministry and just tried to reevaluate the way he delivered prophecy experiences. So um, I think that was that humbled him. And it was good because a lot of the other guys were not humbled. And uh, and so Jack Deere, who was the theologian with surprised by the power of the Spirit, surprised by the voice of God, he, he can kind of continued relating with John Paul Jackson and maintained integrity, theological integrity around the gift of prophecy between John Paul Jackson, Jack Deere, and our Lawrence Sanford, these three. And as conversations developed over the years, finally our Lawrence Sanford comes out with Purifying the Prophetic. And, and in this book, uh, he had two chapters. Uh, one was chapter four, and it was called Reclaiming the Word of the Cross, and chapter five, Loving the Blood of Jesus. And how people have got, seers, visionaries, word of knowledge people have got to understand that unless they're rooted in this, their prophetic gift is going to get polluted and they're going to get into deception and they're going to get confused. Um, because their contemplative focus and their spiritual eyesight is going to get focused on the wrong stuff. Uh, the prophetic gift was born kind of through the baby boomer generation. Uh, and so a lot of the ideologies floating around among the baby boomers, the me generation, ACDC, Highway to Hell. It's a very self-focused generation, very self-centered, narcissistic type of thinking. And so this stuff started to come in uh, as these gifts were being developed. These gifts, these word of knowledge giftings, uh, these dreams and vision giftings, these Nabi gifts were being developed through the vineyard. Um, but unfortunately, the vineyard kind of unofficially accepted a no lordship view of salvation from Dallas. I'm not going to blame Jack Deere for that, um, but he did go to Dallas Theological Seminary. And that is like the headquarters of no lordship cheap grace theology just is. I've looked at Jack Deere's books, though. He does have a sense of sanctification about him, though. So, But everything I've ever seen in the Vineyard or IHOP is a Baptistic no-lordship antinomianism when it comes to salvation in these charismatic churches. And grant that this is the baby boomers with a really narcissistic me focused sort of ideology. So these gifts are being developed with all of that kind of ideology being mixed in. Donald Trump was like a hero in the 80s and in the 90s. And he was, most people don't know this, but Biff Tannen, the villain in the Back to the Future movies, that materialistic capitalist villain, that character is actually based on Donald Trump. So you've got this kind of ideology kind of there mixed into the church. And our Lord Sanford says it's basically Baal worship. Um, and that stuff's getting mixed in. So you have the spirit of Balaam coming into the prophetic ministry. Um, 
and we just need to get back to the gospel and the blood of Jesus and personal moral transformation and biblical obedience. That type of thinking needs to become the thing um, because <clears throat> the line between New Age and true Pentecostal gifts of the Holy Spirit is basically drawn between what kind of theology do you advocate? Pentecostal gifts of the Holy Spirit advocate a theology of Wesleyanism. Always have. Um, and that basically means gospel theology. Um, and I've done a lot of studying on this in the past 10 years. And basically, there's two old books that the Wesleyans uh, have, uh, the, and the Holiness Pentecostal theologians have always kind of supported as being representative of the gospel of Jesus Christ from their point of view. And the first one would be Harold Lindstrom's book, Wesley in Sanctification, in 1946. That was published by Francis Asbury Press and Zondervan from Asbury Theological Seminary. And then the second one was Dr. Kenneth Collins' book, Wesley on Salvation. A study in the standard sermons. Again, Zondervan, Francis Asbury Press. The Lord led me into those books through dreams and visions. I read those books because I had dreams and visions about them. I was becoming very, very concerned in my soul that both pulpiteers and street preachers were not preaching a fully developed gospel presentation. And I was burdened about it for an entire year. And God gave me this dream about Steve Harper's book, The Way to Heaven, which I don't like to encourage too much because he eventually backslid and apostatized into LGBT type Christianity. But the simplicity of his presentation is still pretty good. Although as I was studying that book, uh, I found out about these other ones, which were much more deeper and much more chock full of thoroughness and just pulling the writings of Wesley together into a really cohesive understanding of gospel. Now you might say, now why, why Wesley? Because Wesley is the person who started Methodism, Holiness Movement, and Pentecostalism. And you would not have any charismatic churches today if it were not for Pentecostalism. So the charismatics, this is another thing, man, because when I got saved, I was charismatic for four or five years right after. Charismatics are completely disconnected from church history. Many of them do not know where they come from in terms of historical lineage. Um, I know I didn't. We come from John Wesley. That's where we come from. We come from John Wesley. And we come from William J. Seymour. That's where we come from, man. And uh, Wesley laid the foundations of how to preach the gospel, how to understand salvation, how to understand the Christian life. All the things that we take for granted in what we call a relationship with God, he clarifies it and expounds on it so much that you can you could spend your entire life preaching about it. And as you go about it, trusting that the Holy Spirit will touch people's hearts along the way. When I started reading this, Harold Lindstrom, Wesley and Sanctification, and um, Kenneth Collins, Wesley on Salvation, I saw two or three angel sparkles on those books as I read them. I also saw him on the Way to Heaven by Steve Harper. So what I'm saying is, is not only is this intellectual and doctrinal, it's backed up by dreams and visions as well. Um, so it's a pretty big revelation to me, you know. I got. I started out in prophetic movement without soteriology, and 
because God saw the prayers of my heart, he showed me which way to go. And I believe that, man. Because what I see when I look out at people with these nabby gifts and dreams and visions gifts, I see people who have gifts, genuine gifts from the Holy Spirit, but they've got polluted streams because there's this all this antinomian cheap grace theology mixed in, like the sonship and the orphan spirit teaching and in the uh, the no lordship stuff and the and even the hyper grace teaching that came in through John Crowder and, and other people. You know, this this idea that that you know, don't worry, don't worry. You don't have to live in obedience to the Bible. You know, don't talk about or think about hell. I call that apostasy. I call that apostasy. So, if that's what apostasy looks like, you know, telling people that they don't have to live by the Bible, just accept that you're a son or daughter of God. What's the opposite? What does orthodoxy look like? And that's why I'm going to go over some of the main points here. Um, and when I go over this stuff, it's going to be like, well, I already know that. Well, good. You need to be reminded. Remember, you need to be reminded. We all need to be reminded of the basics of the gospel. And it will purify our spiritual eyesight. You also under, have to understand, John Wesley had prophetic gifts as well. He was mainly a theologian of salvation, but he had gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he had visions. He had dreams. There were people in, in the Methodist groups. He kept records of them having visions and dreams and, and things like this. So there were prophetic gifts with Wesley. It's not like he was this giftless academic theologian. He was more like Jack Deere, you know, in, in a sense that, you know, he was very theological, but at the same time, yeah, he, occasionally he had prophetic gifts. So it's not, I'm not talking about giving up the prophetic ministry and starting to read just books and be, I'm not, t I'm not I'm telling you to blend the gift of the fivefold ministry together here. The teacher and the prophet, they must come together or you're going to have a polluted stream, you know, and now you're watching rated R movies and giving words of knowledge and cussing and not repenting for it and you wonder why you're addicted to porn and you give a word of knowledge to somebody three or four days later there's a polluted stream there right um, the gifts of calling of God are without repentance I, you know and that's scary because you can prophesy in his name and cast out demons and heal people and still go to hell that's what it says in Matthew chapter 7 so it's important that you know you you discipline yourself so that after you have prophesied to others you don't become a castaway. You could give words of knowledge to people. Words of knowledge are not the, are not assurance of salvation, friend. If you give words of knowledge to somebody, you can still go to hell. That's what it says in Matthew 7. If you're lawless, you're going to go to hell. God will still bless other people through your gifts, but if you're not going to live a holy life, uh, it, as far as it comes to you, I'm sorry, bub. Same rules apply. He'll use you. He'll use your gifts in spite of yourself, and then he'll send you to hell afterwards. I believe that. Look what happened to Jaden in the book of Josephus, the prophet who backslid. He said to one guy in the Old Testament, he said, "Come home, come home to dinner with me. Come home to dinner with me." He said. The other prophet said, "No, no, I'm, I'm not allowed. The Lord said I'm not allowed to come." to come with anybody. And he said, yeah, but the Lord told me that you could come home to dinner with me. So he goes to home to dinner with him, and then the Lord, then he, the Lord actually says, you disobeyed the Lord because you came home to dinner with me. And then he went out and got attacked by a lion and died. Josephus says that that fallen prophet was jaded, J-A-D-E-N. He had the gifts of the Holy Spirit, even though he was a backslider. Uh, so, the, you know, and Balaam was pro would probably be in a similar category. Okay, so 
now that that's been said, let's not be like those guys. Let's be like Elijah and Elisha. Let's be like Jesus and the apostles. Let's have the right theology and and uh, as we as we use the gifts and, and we have the right theology, we'll have the right heart attitude, right? That's what Wesley's all about. Having the right heart attitude as you have theology and as you operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So the first book that studies Wesley's doctrines of salvation was Harold Lindstrom's book, Wesley and Sanctification, and I reviewed that. The first thing is original sin. You've got to understand that the whole world has fallen because of Adam and Eve, and this manifests in things like atheism, idolatry, pride, and self-will, people living independent from God and just doing their own thing. Okay, And so this is what we need to be saved from, this lostness that, that we have because of our sin nature that distances us from God. And if we do not come to Christ through the atonement, hell awaits. Babies don't go to hell. Responsible adults at the age of accountability do, who understand God's law and refuse to respond to it. The next thing to take under consideration is atonement, justification, and sanctification. So that when we look at the cross, we have to understand that um, something going on there is called penal substitution. In other words, Jesus substituted himself for the penalty due to us for our crimes against God. Okay, so instead of us having the penalty of eternal punishment in hell, Jesus took the penalty of substituting his body on the cross for us. Um, so we put our faith in that substitute penalty. Um, and that saves us from eternal eternal punishment in hell. That is justification by faith alone. God declares us as the judge not guilty because we put our faith in the atoning sacrifice of his son Jesus and his blood. The next thing is sanctification, where because now that we have been declared not guilty and are going through a process of being adopted as children of God, God now tells us to keep his commandments and walk in all of his commandments blameless and, and to live in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life, that being the understanding. In other words, obedience to the Bible. And we grow in this. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. Matthew 7, 5, 6, and 7. We grow in obedience to the Ten Commandments from our heart. The focus is now on the heart. It's not that we have outward tablets of the law that we're staring at only, but that the Holy Spirit writes those commandments on our heart and we love the law of God. And we make it our meditation all the day. So in justification, we experience the forgiveness of sins by faith in the atoning blood sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. In sanctification, we grow in love as an ethical and moral sense of righteous, holy love, which blends the Ten Commandments with affection towards God and people. The next thing to take under consideration is how high can holiness get? You can reach spiritual heights, spiritual highs, as you pursue holiness. And these spiritual highs are usually brought to their pinnacle, spiritual highs are, are usually brought to their pinnacle through prolonged amounts of prayer um, in Bible study, particularly on the moral commandments of God in the, in the New Testament, and trying to make your will come into conformity with those commandments through prayer, lots and lots of prayer. So, uh, and uh, that's, you know, that's how it is, you know, you uh, loving God and loving people. Loving God is the prayer life, is the Bible study, is the conformity of the heart to the commands of God through Bible study. You're studying the Bible in order to obey it, and uh, you're having a really a lot of prayer life. And so the quantity of Bible study, 
the quantity of heartfelt obedience to the commands, and the quantity, the amount of prayer life that you have uh, will, will determine how much sanctification you achieve. And you can achieve spiritual highs, pinnacles so high, in fact, that expressions have been used like Christian perfection, entire sanctification, etc. Um, and where the sanctification can get so high, the breaking off of sinful addictions is so, so remote that you almost at times can mistake yourself into thinking that you're without sin, which is not true. If any man claims to be without sin, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. But it can get to that point. It can get to the point where you can actually trick yourself into thinking that you're living without sin. Um, and But you can always backslide. See, Wesley always believed that if people can reach the, the, the height of sanctification, well, take heed lest you fall because you can still backslide from that. Uh, and then the last, uh, a, a huge thing in Wesleyan theology is Hebrews 12, 14. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. You will go to hell if you do not have holiness in your life. And holiness is understood as Bible study and Bible obedience, moral commandment keeping, faith in the blood of Jesus, and having a prayer life. And that, that it, it reaches a pinnacle where the breaking off of sinful addictions happens and you're, you're so in love with God, you're so obsessed with the Bible, uh, you are just, you're just having a high and holy time in the Lord. And you don't have to be in a spiritual high to go to heaven, but you have to be working towards it. And that's the understanding of holiness. You're going on to perfection, although that you have not necessarily attained it, there's movement towards that fixing your eyes on Jesus, just moving towards holiness. And as you're moving towards holiness, you can rest assured that you're on your way to heaven, right? The blood of Jesus started it for you and preserves it for you so that as you fluctuate in holiness, the blood of Jesus covers you in your fluctuations. But because you're fluctuating and because you're pushing towards uh you're climbing the mountain of holiness, you can you can rest assured that you'll see God on Mount Zion someday. Okay. If there's no holiness in your life and you just live in constant addiction and carnality all the days of your life and you don't care, you're going to hell. Holiness or hell. Hebrews twelve fourteen. The last thing to take under consideration is the day of judgment. Matthew seven, twenty one to twenty three. There will be a day in which God will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has appointed, Jesus. And so since he's the judge, the Father is not the judge, Jesus is the judge. Since he is the person who will judge the souls on the day of judgment according to their works, the dead will be judged according to their works, not according to just faith in the blood of Jesus, but according to what they did with their lives. Um, it's Jesus who's going to do it. So therefore, the Sermon on the Mount is extremely important to make the pattern of your life because that's most likely the body of law that he's going to judge the world on. It is Jesus' teaching on the Ten Commandments. Okay, so that's Harold Lindstrom in a nutshell in his explanation of Wesley's gospel presentation. And now we're going to start it all over again with a regurgitation from Dr. Kenneth Collins. Okay. Again, we start off with him in the Wesley on Salvation book with original sin. But this time, he brings out the fact that the Holy Spirit is all over the world through omnipresence and working on the consciences of men by providing them a sense of right and wrong in their heart. Everyone is born with this sense of right and wrong in their heart. Even though Genesis 6-5 says they're also plagued with thoughts and feelings of evil continually. But the Holy Spirit's omnipresence uh, uh, draws people through the sense of what we call conscience 
towards understanding that it is through the Bible and it's through Jesus that answers all of the longings of the human conscience, a.k.a. the universal uh, provenient grace. Not saving grace. This, this universal sense of conscience of right and wrong does not save people from hell, it, but it prepares them for the gospel. Uh, and so it can lead to faith in the cross saving grace. The next thing is that the moral law, usually understood to be the Ten Commandments, uh, awakens conviction of sin. A lot of times people are spiritually slumbering and lukewarm and don't really realize that they even have sin. They think that the only type of sin is like the worst possible thing, like murdering a person or molesting children. You know, And this concept comes from police and comes from law and order and it comes from crime, comes from the civil law, right? And at least they have that sense of right and wrong, right? Um, but even that branches out of the Ten Commandments. You shall not have any other gods before me. You shall not make unto thyself any graven image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You shall keep the Sabbath day holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not commit adultery and you shall not covet. Now, when those things are said, and even by me saying those to you, all of a sudden sin was awakened in you. And you understood what sin was, even though you weren't necessarily thinking about it before. But because the moral law was uttered, now all of a sudden, Sin guilt might have just peaked inside your heart, and you might want to pray a prayer of repentance. This now leads the conscience to turn to Jesus Christ on the cross who died for your sins, your breaking of the Ten Commandments in your heart. And this becomes the means of grace that leads you to salvation. When a person understands the book of Romans chapter 3 and chapter 4, when they understand that Jesus' perfect sinless righteousness is why he was able to be the go-between for us on the cross, he imputes his righteousness to our unrighteous life, and we are declared not guilty by the gavel of God. And we experience justification by faith alone and the forgiveness of sins. Now, the moral law after this point becomes a means of growing in righteousness during the Christian life. Okay, 1 Timothy 1.8 says that we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. So we do not use the law to earn or to develop any sense of favor with God, but it becomes the rule for our life as saved, as justified children of God becomes the ruler for our life. We want to please our Father that we love, and therefore we're going to try to do what he says. And his blood covers us, but because we love him, we're going to try to do what he says. We utterly reject antinomianism in all of its forms. So like this Leif Hetland guy who teaches healing the orphan spirit, he says things like, being a Christian is not about keeping the law. It's about love. As if it, you have to make a choice between one or the other. right? Whereas Romans 13 says that the Ten Commandments, if, they, if you are motivated by the love of the Holy Spirit, you will want to keep the Ten Commandments and fulfill them. Because the first part of the Ten Commandments, if you love God, you will fulfill those things towards him. The second part of the Ten Commandments, if you love mankind, you will fulfill love towards them, right? But Leif Hetland, in his false de teachings in the Charismatic with the Sonship teaching, he says, being a Christian is not about keeping the law, it's about love. Well, you see, he's teaching sentimentalism. He's taking the law of God away from Christian love, and he's teaching sentimentality and emotionalism. See? So people, people who are into that tip type of a teaching, 
They don't understand things like John 8, 11, go and sin no more. They don't understand that. Right? They're narcissistic. They want all their own gratification and emotions to be fulfilled because maybe they're just extremely selfish people. And another thing could be that they went through emotional traumas, but, but because they are so selfish, right, they keep on hanging on to this self-centered form of theology and are not willing to submit to the holy laws of God. The next thing in chapter 4 of Wesley on Salvation uh, is that uh, the Holy Spirit comes into the hearts of men and makes them born again. This is called regeneration. And this is what gives you the faith, this sense of that you know that you know. You just believe in the gospel. It's an indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in the heart. Not to be confused with the external baptism in the Holy Spirit that you might feel in charismatic worship or prayer. This is the indwelling Holy Spirit burning in the belly or the Aldersgate experience. Were not our hearts burning within us as he talked with us along the way and opened up the scriptures to us? The next thing talked about is good works, especially keeping God's commandments in your life. And uh, without holiness, that's the understanding. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord, Hebrews 12, 14. With the Holy Spirit's help, all things are possible. And growth in righteousness is possible. But you must try to grow in righteousness without becoming a bigot, which is very challenging because as you grow in biblical righteousness, you're going to be able to see um, true and false, right and wrong, more and more and more, and you're going to become a little judge. And it's hard not to be bigoted when you're starting to see all of these things and have all these firm ethical convictions, but it's just part of the growth process. Love is the most important thing we've got to understand, 1 Corinthians 13. We've got to understand that, the attributes of love. But uh, that doesn't mean that we lose our sense of right and wrong. Right. Those two things go together. Right. Um, the last thing to talk about is the possibility of backsliding through temptations, trials, and tribulations, pain, and suffering. These are intended to either make or break a Christian, um, and they're intended to purify your faith as gold, 1 Peter 1, 6 to 7. But there's always a way of escape from temptation, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So we need to walk in continual repentance and confession with God, uh, understand that we're in a constant war between good and evil, Galatians 5, 17, that we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, Philippians 2, 12, um, and that uh, we can... Um, we can lose our first love, but we can also get saved again, Revelation 2, 4, and 5. But some people backslide uh, permanently, Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. So that's it. I mean, we've got to – it's not, it's not a one-and-done thing. It's not a once-saved, always-saved, easy grace, sonship thing like we're just – you know, could just sit there and relax. It's not about cheap grace. It's about costly grace like what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called in the cost of discipleship, costly grace. God gives us grace through the sacrifice of his son Jesus. But after he gives us that grace, he gives us personal moral responsibility to keep the word of God in our lives. And that's that's what they mean by costly grace. It's, it's a grace, that, but it, it costs you something. You have to be willing to give up everything. Jesus said, if you're not willing to take up your cross and follow him, then you, you cannot be his disciple you cannot experience the benefits of his cross you know and that's what antinomianism teaches people this leaf hetland stuff this you're a son or daughter of god blah 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 they say you can take you can get all the benefits of jesus's cross but you don't have to do anything with about your cross so there's no personal moral responsibility whatsoever it's 100 percent narcissistic baby boomers sort of ideology being mixed into the prophetic ministry and I want to come right back to that because here I've been talking like an evangelist the whole time the fivefold ministry in Ephesians 4:11 is not a fourfold ministry it's a fivefold ministry you're supposed to have five characters in 
the church. Apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers. But the evangelist always gets kicked out because of narcissistic baby boomer ideology and seeker sensitive theology. The evangelist gets kicked out. Hell's never talked about. Repentance never talked about. Blood of Jesus never talked about. Forgiveness of sins never talked about. Obedience to the word of God never talked about. Backsliding never talked about. The heights of sanctification never talked about. Handling movie issues and cussing issues or friendship relationship issues never talked about. Hardly ever. And you end up with this really morally lax idea of how to live your life. And every Sunday you come to, come to church just to worship. And nobody has anything in common with anyone. Because nobody believes the same. There's no doctrinal foundation whatsoever. And yet, the words of knowledge continue. The words of knowledge continue. Happy, encouraging words. Well, you know, that's weak. That's weak. God gave us the Great Commission to preach the gospel with signs of following. But the modern day prophetic charismatic churches, God in his grace is still giving these guys gifts. And I look at this situation, I think to myself, man, God is very patient because these prophets are, are getting gifts and they're still not preaching the gospel. Year after year after year, there's still no justification in sanctification being preached in these churches. And it, it is astonishing to me that God even gives these people gifts anymore. You know. Uh, so we have to be faithful. You know, if, if we've been given gifts from the Holy Spirit, we have to be faithful to the Great Commission. You know, and we're not called to have a fourfold ministry. We're called to have a fivefold ministry with the role of the evangelist in the church. And if you're not an evangelist by nature and you're a pastor, you need to make yourself into an evangelist because you're told to do the work of an evangelist as a pastor. To preach repentance and faith in the blood of Jesus. Repent and believe in the gospel. That is so. That is that is supposed to be the entire theological context for all of your word of knowledge ministry. You're not supposed to just be thinking about this cheap grace, sonship versus orphan spirit ideology where nobody can backslide and nobody's pursuing righteousness and nobody's even studying the Bible. You know, it is, you know, a lot of these prophetic ministers, I think, are just operating on borrowed time. You know, they're 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 so unfaithful to to the message of salvation, so completely unfaithful, and it just astonishes me, astonishes me that they even still are even able to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There is such a need for quote prophetic reformation as as John Paul Jackson used to say. And, uh, yeah, well, I've said my piece. God bless you out there. This is John with WesleyGospel.com.